We are in the season of Easter as we continue to hear the impact that the resurrection has on life as told through the story of our faith. Resurrection is about new life. It's about new possibilities. It's about hope that overflows in the midst of a weary world. This year at Bethlehem, we have been focusing on the theme of resonance. That is, how the story of our faith resonates with our personal stories in life. And when we share our stories of resonance with others, when we share how God's story has connected with our story, the people who hear them are blessed as our stories resonate with others. In this season of Easter, the story of resurrection, the story of new life, the story of God's grace unfolding is as much surprising as it is life-giving. So today, Bill Vossler shares his story of resonance, which is all about new life and surprise as his early experience with religion turned him off for 18 years before, well, to his surprise, he found new life from a God of grace and love. Now, in the season of Easter, hear how Bill's story of resonance might resonate with you as you encounter the God of Easter, the God of resurrection, the God of new life, the God of hope. My first memory of church harkens back to shortly after my mother and we three boys moved from Billings to mom's ancestral home of Wishick, North Dakota, following her divorce from my father, Julius, a tortured World War II prisoner of war. I was four, had fallen asleep, and was placed on a pew in the dark sanctuary while mom attended a meeting in the basement. I woke in darkness, fearful and screaming. I heard sounds on the basement steps, and a moment later, my Aunt Edna grabbed me and hugged me fiercely, speaking words of endearment. I felt comforted. Unfortunately, that was the last time I felt comforted by church and religion for many years. Every Sunday, we of the Evangelical United Brethren Church endured hellfire and brimstone sermons where we were informed that we were wretched sinners without hope of redemption. Our minister would say, no sinners will escape the soon coming day when Jesus Christ returns in all his glory. Repent of your sins or boil in the hot oil of God's wrath in the fire and brimstone of hell. I didn't understand how sins worked. I knew Adam and Eve had bequeathed me a colony of sins the second I was born, but why? What had I done wrong? And those sins kept dragging me down toward hell's raging inferno. And what could I do about them? Nothing I knew of. When I asked adults how to rid myself of my sins so I wouldn't burn in hell, they didn't take me seriously. Mom said, ah, don't be so silly. Aunt Edna added, ah, don't worry about it, just be good. Why couldn't we be like my Catholic classmates who confess sins each Sunday and wipe their slate clean so they could start piling up more again on Monday or even Sunday afternoon? Even more troubling were the sermons delivered by my new grandmother, Mary Fetzer, after mom remarried when I was six. Grandma Fetzer catapulted into my life as mom and we three boys were eating our noon meal a few days after the wedding. Our front door smashed open as if struck with a battering ram, smacked against the radiator and bounced back, shuddering. A woman stood on our doorstep in a white turban, print dress, white knit shawl over her shoulders, and brown stockings sagging down her ankles. She held an open book in one palm. Yeep, I cried, clattering my fork onto my plate and knocking a chicken thigh onto the floor as I hid behind mom. I was confused and frightened. While sunlight exploded around her head, she thumped the book with her other hand. In our Germans from Russia dialect, she croaked, Ich sag dem Bibel, it says in the Bible. Mommy, I whispered, is she an angel or the devil? Ach, no, Mom said, she's your new grandmother. Grossmutter, my grandmother shrieked, Gott im Himmel, grandmother, God in heaven, not as long as the sun shines. Her hand swiped the air, erasing that dark blackboard, that dark possibility from the blackboard of life. 
but I married your son, Mom said, so my boys are your... Grandma shrieked again and shook her head. Socks knit, ish knit, say not, is not. They aren't, for you have made an adulterer of my son in the eyes of the Lord our God Almighty. Flames seemed to leap from her eyes. She pawed ravenously at the onion skin pages of the Bible. She thumped the book, wailing as she punctuated again. Ishtatum Bible, it says in the Bible. Whosoever marrieth a divorced woman, she thumped the Bible harder, commits adultery, Matthew 5.32. These are the words of God. She clapped the Bible shut with a shot like artillery fire. I jumped. Then the door was open and empty and mom slumped against me and uttered a stifled sob. I was crying too. Each door clattering visit from Grandma Fetzer filled me with darkness, a descent into the black heart of a mountain. Each time I jumped in surprised and screeched, ruining drawings or clay animals or knocking agates off the table to strew against the floor. Once I nearly stuck my food-filled fork up my nostril. She stunned me each time she appeared. During each episode, Grandma produced a three-act play. Act one was Matthew 5.32, reminding Mom that she, a divorced woman, had forced Walter into adultery. I did not know what adultery meant, but I knew it was not good. For Act 2, Grandma read her next favorite sermon for our household from Exodus 34, 7. The sins of the father are visited upon the child, even unto the third and fourth generations. Not any generic father I sensed, but my own unworthy dad. I knew he had sinned grievously. No pictures of him in our house. His name was never mentioned. He never visited, as though he was dead, which in a way he was. Exodus 34, 7 filled me with despair. First the weight of the sins from Adam and Eve. Now I trembled facing hordes of additional sins laid on me by my father, and those from his father, and maybe even his father, even unto the third and fourth generations back, piling, piling, piling. I felt overwhelmed by rottenness. During each of her appearances, a third act followed, a variation of her favorite theme, the apocalypse. The end of the world was nigh. Following the great Alaskan earthquake of 1964, she crashed open our door saying, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, Revelation 6:12. Same for a solar eclipse or reddish orange moon, when she said, it's blood of the moon, there's blood on the moon. From her, after this, we began to call her Apocalypse Granny. From her repetitions, my fears multiplied, so I began to pay attention to the rising of the winds and shattering lightning and pounding thunder, searching for signs in the night stars, feeling for the earth shuddering beneath my feet or the blinking out of the sun or blood on the moon. I was positive that one day Grandma would smash the door open amidst a light so bright I could not bear to look at it and usher in the end of the world. Meanwhile, her sermons continued, many from Revelation, her favorite book. Every verse seemed to pulse with calamity. Revelation 6, 8, And behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with beasts of the earth. How was I going to die? About this time, I realized I had become the poster child for breaking commandments, and I was damned. How could I keep the Sabbath day holy when I had to deliver the Minneapolis Tribune every Sunday? And thou shalt not kill. I killed beasts every day, mosquitoes, grasshoppers, birds, gophers. I failed, thou shalt have no other gods before me, because my coin collection, stamp collection, playing baseball, and searching the ravine for fossils were more enjoyable to me than God. Curiously, the only time I found peace in my EUB church was following communion, when the sanctuary metamorphosed into a seemingly wild and lawless place. We called it old prayer because it differed so distinctly from regular prayer. Passers-by on the narrow sidewalk out front of the white building could be forgiven for thinking the cries of pain, shrieks of terror, and supplications to God that they heard portended tortures applied by snapping whips, red-hot metal, or sharp knives. They would have been partially correct, for the tortures were self-inflicted by parishioners exclaiming their sinful failings aloud. 
when old prayer started, everybody in the congregation rose in a body, turned around, faced the back, and knelt on the hardwood floor. We leaned our elbows on the warm pew, folded our hands, pressed our thumbs against our foreheads, and with closed eyes prayed, out loud, in the Germans from Russia dialect. Some parishioners believed God only heard prayers in that language. I used the time to gaze around and study the comely girls and women. Yes, more sinning. Moments later, mutterings grew louder, rising into falsetto, the drizzle of words becoming clear and plaintive. Jesus, what have I done? And forgive me, Herr. Forgive me, Lord. And ich hab nicht gelebt in Gott. I have not lived a good life. Lightning flashes of high-pitched wailings and keenings of indescribable loss. Dark words of heimweh, home pain. People desperately missing that other place in the old country of the Ukraine. Der Schwarze Meer, the Black Sea, which still held them in thrall. The storm rose in fury, frenzied, ululating wail of quavering voices, like pummeling hailstones, obliterating each other, a frenzied tower of Babel, interspersed with heart-rending sobs and massive sighs and groans, timbers of a sea-battered sh ship which could stand no more. When I peered over the back of my pew and gazed at all those poor sailors adrift in the sea of life, I was overwhelmed by their cries of pain and the tears streaming down their faces. I was also astounded. These innocent looking men and women that I knew to be good people were admitting grievous sins of straying from the ways of the Lord, general sins I could not imagine them committing. That they were sinners too gave me pause and that sense of peace. I was not alone, even adults sinned too. Sometimes I would hear someone ask God to guide Billy, the wayward servant to keep him on the straight and narrow, to forge him into a sharp, sacred sword of the Lord. After 15 minutes, the sobs lessened. The crying subsided into whimpering. Heartfelt, fervent amens emanated from every corner of the church. The great storm ended. Old prayer for an old people from an old country, yearning for an old way of life forever lost, was over. By the time I left Wishick to attend college, religion for me was broken. For the next 18 years, I did not attend church, except when I wanted to play basketball while I taught on Standard Rock Sioux Indian Reservation. There, the sole available gym was the LDS church, where we had to listen to a sermon before we could play. In 1983, I quit teaching to become a full-time professional writer. Though I was selling articles to magazines, pay was slow so I needed a short-time job to tide me over. That was teaching writing for a woman on pregnancy leave at Devil, Devil's Lake Community College in Devil's Lake, New, North Dakota. My office mate was Nikki's sister. She kept saying to me, you and my sister have so many things in common. Then she'd whisper, except she's a feminist. After many f long phone calls with Nikki, I moved to St. Cloud. A year later, we married and I nervously began to attend Bethlehem Lutheran Church with her, waiting to be reminded once more what a rotten sinner I was. Instead, I was overwhelmed as Bethlehem presented a new day of religion and spirituality to me, a church that portrayed a loving God and a loving Jesus, a place where I could be forgiven for my sins and be loved for who I am. And here I am, 37 years later, gloriously happy and filled with joy to be part of this church, still feeling loved and loving the church and the people of Bethlehem. <laughs>